Okay, um, it's 12 o'clock, so we'll go ahead and get started. Make sure my microphone is on and working. Um, welcome everybody to our July user group. We got a, a full room here in New Orleans and we got um, quite, a, quite a few folks out on the web as well. So thanks for joining as always. Um, today we uh, wanted to provide a quick kind of a networking update and then discuss the vice level ring a little bit. Um, <clears throat> it might seem okay, like what is there to discuss? We make a ring and uh, there ain't much to it, but there's a, lot, there's a lot of things about the device level ring and some, some new uh, capabilities that have come about in the last year from Rockwell. So we thought it'd be nice to kind of show that to everybody just to make everybody aware of it and show some maybe some hidden things that you're, you just weren't familiar with. So we'll, we'll get into all that in a minute. Um, but as we always do when we start, we just kind of like to talk about what's coming up on our schedule for our user groups. And um, <clears throat> so uh, next month is a ProSoft update. Um, ProSoft, I think, will be actually here in New Orleans, and they're going to talk a little bit about their some of their cloud connectivity solutions, their data logger, and their their flow computer, um, which is a really nice thing for this uh, for this oil and gas market. Um, September, looking at drives update with Rockwell um, PowerFlex 6000. We show two dates there. We're, we're not quite sure what date it's going to land on yet. We have a training class going on in, in the usual middle of September, so we'll adjust either before or after that class. October, um, we're gonna do a, a, a machine safety topic, something we haven't really, we, well, we did machine safety a little bit earlier in the year, but with guard, uh, um, guard link, but talk about smart safety solutions for machines. So um, there's a lot of confusion, you know, when it comes to machine safety stuff versus process safety stuff sometimes. So it's kind of good to help explain that and, and show what machine safety is all about. Nothing in November because that is uh, automation fair. And then in December, we always kind of do a, a best in show as we call it. So kind of an automation fair review. So if you couldn't make it to Chicago, we'll, um, we'll give you a little update of what we saw there at the show. Um, so today is a networking topic. We haven't done a networking topic this year, but um, you know, going back to our archives, I mean, we have all of our archives for at least for the last several years posted and uh, we've done quite a few topics. So, so there's some background stuff out there if you want to get a little more information. So back going way back to January 2016, we did a kind of how to configure a Stratix 5700 switch. It's a really nice topic on how to get into the, the 5700 and how to configure it using the device manager as well as Studio 5000's add-on profile. In October, we did a, we call it demystifying industrial ethernet networking. So that was, or October, 2017. So that was kind of a, a bigger picture of, of industrial networking, um, the pieces, parts, and how it all kind of comes together. And then uh, uh, last year we did an, an IntelliCenter MCC networking design topic. So that was, that was very specific around MCCs and, and ethernet networking to them. So as always, we invite you to go back to the archives and uh, and watch those presentations, or or get the um, um, or, or get the uh, um, the slides from those ones. I was looking because Luis was texting me saying he he lost his network connection, but uh, he'll be back on in a second, hopefully. Um, again, so automation fair, just to kind of plug that away. We're we're getting close, believe it or not. July, August is like next week, <laughs> um, and before you know it, November is going to be here. Um, so uh, Chicago is the uh, location this year. It's November the 20th and 21st. So that's always used the week before Thanksgiving. So um, trip to Chicago in November, um, bring your coats. But it's always a great, op uh, great event. If, uh, if you've never been to Automation Fair, it's a great event. Uh, huge, huge show. Lots of training opportunities. Lots of just uh, meeting vendors, you know, all the Encompass partners of Rockwell and seeing all the products. All right, so today um, I'm gonna do the talking as well as Elise. So um, I got to put my mug shot up there this time. Uh, Elise is in Houston, so he'll join us uh, remote if his network is connection is back up, hopefully. Um, and um, so just yes. introduce myself. You're back, Luis? Yes, sir. Excellent. Uh, introduce myself, I'm a automation specialist with the Reynolds company here in New Orleans. Um, so my products, I cover the, the automation, the networking software products. And Luis is a solution architect out of Houston, um, covers our, our area as well, South Louisiana. 
All right, so um, our agenda today uh, is pretty straightforward. Um, Luis will give us a quick uh, update on the Stratix uh, products, the, the Ethernet switches, and then we'll break in down into the device level ring stuff that we were um, talking about. So uh, I guess I'll have to drive for you. So uh, I'll let you, uh, Luis will take this part for us. Awesome, I appreciate it. Uh, yeah, so I'll go ahead and give an update on kind of what we're doing with the Stratic Switch and the Managed Switch lineup. Uh, one of the things, the reason why we're doing this is if you guys haven't seen it before, we have what's called the Converge Plant-Wide Ethernet Design Guide. Uh, we call it CPWE for short. Uh, essentially, that provides you white papers and design guidelines on any type of networking architecture that you might be able to think of. Uh, so when we're talking about this ring, the DLR, redundant star, resiliency, going through firewalls and uh, IT infrastructures, we have guidelines and documentation for it all on our website. If anyone can't find it, uh, this presentation that Wayne's put together will have some helpful links at the very bottom on the last couple of slides. So this is a partnership that we have between Rockwell and Cisco. So we got together and put some guidelines and reference architectures together so that we're using the same architecture designs from an IT and even the OT, which is our like process control network side. Uh, so just be aware that we have a couple of things and the documentation and a lot of what Wayne is gonna be talking about today is referenced in the newer document that we, was done back in April, 2019. So just a couple of months ago, go ahead. So when we're talking Stratix, uh, Stratix is our lineup when it comes to the unmanaged and managed switches. Uh, so right now, on what you see on the left-hand side is our unmanaged. I'll talk about those in just slightly. We have a newer lightly managed switch, which is our Stratix 2500. This would take the place of an unmanaged switch. We wouldn't do anything fancy when it comes to the networking, but it provides all of the flexibility and the benefits of a managed switch to design. And then we have our standard, the 5700, the 5800 that I'm gonna be talking about new, along with some security appliances. So we're not gonna cover it here, but we did reference it on our previous presentation on SIP security. We do have a firewall option, so it's the Stratix 5950. And then what you see on the right-hand side is our ethernet devices when it comes to control logics, uh, the ANTR cards when it comes to connecting to an older slick device or uh, point IO, all of those communication are Ethernet IP. And then we also have a collection of embedded switch uh, technology pieces like the ETAPs uh, when we, you want to do just copper uh, DLRs or device level ring, fiber multi-mode connections, or even NAT for network address translation. Go ahead and go to the next slide. The Stratix 2000, as I mentioned, is just a, our standard unmanaged switch. It has all of the kind of needs that you would have. And it uh, goes down from a little small five port switch all the way up to a 16 port switch. And we are able to support uh, 100 meg gig and also SFP for fiber connections. The Stratix 2500 at that level now gives you a full Cisco based environment in a Rockwell platform. And that would give us a five port and also an eight port copper only connection that we would be able to add into the switch and give you all of the flexibility and the benefits to connecting it to compact logics, control logics, and to the HMI for diagnostics and uptime. Right, next slide, please. So once we get to the Stratix 5700, this is when we start getting into kind of our bread and butter managed switch. This is our preferred switch that we would see typically in most of our architectures. Uh, you would have one per panel in most cases. This is also the switch that's included inside of our intelligent motor control. So the MCC designs have this switch. And this goes from a six port all the way up to a 20 port the combo ports that you see there at the bottom, uh, you have the option, those are usually for uplinking or connecting to another switch. Those would be tied in either via copper or they use that uh, SFP small form fact plugin to be able to do fiber and the fiber can be either multi-mode, single mode, 100 meg or gig. And then this design for the 5700 also supports uh, device level ring directly. So a lot of the architecture and the review that Wayne will do a little later 
will include the 5700 as part of the design directly onto the device level ring. Uh, so uh, on to the next one. The 5400, so this is a larger version of the 5700 where the 5700 has multiple 100 meg ports that would connect to our control system. The 5400 now gives you the flexibility of having all gig connections. So it's a layer two or layer three switch. It can provide uh, full gig connections to all. And we can also support up to three uh, device level ring connections onto the, uh, this switch. So this typically we'll see at least one of these switches connected to multiple 5700s, or a lot of the times what we'll also see is the ability of being able to tie in uh, Versa views, the thin clients or server-based systems directly in because of the gig connection. Next slide. And then this is our newer switch that you guys will see within the, the end of the summer. So the Stratix 5800, we've been talking about this at TechEd. Uh, you will all, we did also provide uh, an example of this at the previous automation fair. So Wayne just talked about automation fair coming up. So for anybody that went to the previous one, you were able to see this live. So this will be a replacement style for what we consider the Stratix 8000 right now. So this is gonna be a modular based switch. The size that you see there, it's a 10 port uh, switch. You're either gonna have have the ability of being able to put expansion modules on this. So this becomes uh, heavily utilized when you don't, you haven't finalized the design and you don't know if you're going to need 12, 16 ports going forward, or if it's all going to be fiber or copper. This will give you the flexibility of being able to add this and then you can do the expansion to it. So it's an eight or 16 port expansion in copper, SFPs, and also it's going to provide power over ethernet. This this unit will also support device level ring. So as you start seeing the designs that we're gonna put forth in a little bit, the same switch will be able to put, um, be placed into that system. Go ahead. And then one, one really quick benefit that I'll talk about before I'll let Wayne kind of do his song and dance on his end is a couple of the uh, key benefits and differentiation is so on the Stratix lineup, because of the partnership on Cisco, what we're doing is we're taking the Cisco technology and putting it in an industrial format. So at that level, it is now looking at our kind of premier integration point of view. So for, from the controller, the compact logics, the control logics, the managed switch, is now part of that architecture and provides quality of service and priorities based off that technology. So Ethernet IP, SIP as a common industrial um, program platform is all tied in there. And what we'll see and what you're seeing on the slide here are the benefits that we have in the device level ring side. We're able to bring that in directly into the factory talk family, both from a panel view plus six and seven or also just factory talk view SC environment. So now we're able to connect the switch itself directly into the control system, own it at that level. And now you have the option of being able to connect and manage it via Studio 5000. You can manage it via web page configuration, or you can still do uh, Cisco CLI, uh, so command line interface. If you add it into the HMI, at this level, you're now getting diagnostics directly at the HMI level. You can set up alarming based off of it. You can also enable and disable ports based off of the uh, factory talk view install. So those are just a couple of the benefits that you'll see directly from it uh, on using the Stratic switches with your control logics or compact logics. Okay, I think that finishes up my spiel. Yep, all right, thanks Luis. Yeah, so this is just like, like Luis was saying there. I mean, that's one of the strongest benefits of the Stratix family, especially if you're in the integrator architecture with the, with, with the Logix family is that tight integration. You bring in an add-on profile into the Studio 5000. You get all those, you know, all that information out of the switch is, is as accessible as tags in your, in your controllers. Um, and then you can take it into your HMI as well. So uh, we'll, we'll show the faceplate again a little bit later. Um, a little bit of a teaser for what's coming up here in a few. So um, device level ring. So once again, um, you know, the concept of a ring is, is very straightforward, right? I mean, you, you, you connect items and then you put them into a ring. So um, 
nothing earth shattering here. And Advice Level Ring's been out for quite some time. So, uh, um, but as a quick refresher, we'll go through some of the various, you know, there's a few topologies, right? And there's pros and cons to every topology. So first is the linear topology, right? Very easy to implement, uh, daisy chain approach, shall we say. Um, obviously the biggest disadvantage of a linear topology is if you had a break somewhere in the middle, well then everything downstream from that break is, is lost and not accessible back by the controller. Um, we see star topology, right? That's very common. So, you know, central switch stars out, you know, the home runs out to each spot. So um, advantages, you, you, you're, you know, you can tolerate, you know, if, if your robot arm goes down, well, the rest of your system's still operating there in that, in that particular diagram. Um, uh, but there's really no resiliency here, um, you know, in, in this particular uh, system. So you can do redundant star, um, and this is basically running out, you know, two links, you know, out to, uh, to your switches. Um, so it gives you the advantage of being more resilient, um, can withstand one of those cable or one of those ports were to fail, it would switch to the, to the secondary port. Um, disadvantage there is obviously there's a lot of wiring and additional complexity with your configuration. Uh, it should be noted too that the, um, typically when you're talking redundant star, you're looking at a couple of what they call resiliency protocols. Um, so down there at the bottom, uh, typically you're looking at spanning tree, uh, flex links and ether channel. Spanning tree and ether channel are pretty much uh, standards that are used in any body switch, no matter what brand you use. Flex links is a Cisco proprietary resiliency protocol. Um, and normally, spanning tree would not be recommended in an industrial uh, control situation because it's got a very long, what's known as a, a convergence time. So convergence time is basically how long does it take to recover from a fault? You know, it has to detect the fault and then kind of rearrange the, the system. Spanning tree can be pretty slow. Flex links and ether channel are much faster uh, resiliency protocols. And then we come to uh, device level ring, DLR. So this has always been the fastest convergence time um, arc type of architecture, meaning that it recovers the network the quickest. Um, but the biggest disadvantage of a, of a ring, of course, is it's a single point of failure. So, you know, we can tolerate one point of failure in that ring, but if it has a second failure somewhere along the line, and you're kind of back into that linear topology um, type architecture, right? So if you had another break after, the, after you become a, a flat linear network, then you're going to lose some devices behind that second break. Now for DLR, um, again, device, the DLR means device level ring. So initially, when we talked about DLR for control systems, it was truly device level, meaning that you didn't have the switches in the ring like we're kind of showing in these diagrams here. So you would just daisy chain pretty much from device to device, right from your controller, right to an IO drop, right to a drive, um, you know, back up to your controller. So did not have to have a switch in the mix. Um, but you did have to have a few, so there's a few um, uh, things in, in, the, in, the, uh, in the ring. Um, first off, the, the yellow dots are all just, these are more definitions for us, is what's known as a ring node. So every device in the ring is a ring node. Um, but you had to have one device in there was known as a supervisor. Okay, so a supervisor basically, um, as the name implies, and it's on the next slide too, we'll, we'll hit that, but you know, that's the guy that's kind of managing the ring and detecting when there's a break and, and deciding um, what to do. The, um, now, the common question we always get is, uh, who can be a ring manager um, in the system? So those are the guys that can be ring managers or ring supervisors. Uh, Control Logics, uh, EN2TR card can be a ring supervisor, and ETAP can actually be a supervisor. Compact Logic CPUs, both the 1769 and the newer 5069 uh, can be uh, ring, ring supervisors. The two switches uh, Luis was talking about there, the 5700 and the 5400 can do it, and the NATR device as well can, can do it. You do have the ability to create what's called a backup supervisor. So in the, uh, in the, in the rare situation where say the, the switch, um, which is the supervisor in this, in this diagram, the red dot, um, if there was some sort of a, perhaps a software failure in the switch, but the port could still do its thing, 
um, then it could go, supervisor could move to the backup supervisor. Um, so in red, again, kind of shows you what the job of the supervisor is, right? He's, his job is one to prevent a network loop, right? Because again, you're, you're, cre you're, you're connecting a ring, you're making a loop. So, so it is actually shutting the port down and preventing that, that loop from happening. Um, it can detect, you know, if it's active or backup status, the ring integrity, fault recovery, diagnostics, and a feature that uh, may not be known very well is that uh, you can actually do a DHCP server inside of a DLR ring. So you can actually have the ring supervisor assign IP addresses to the nodes in the ring. And we'll show that in a bit too. And the ring participants, again, those are like the ring, you know, basically you're just the guys that are hanging out on the ring. They don't really have a supervisory um, job. Now, uh, again, so what we've been so common, common you know, place and what we've seen the most is kind of the example on the far left, just the, uh, the, the device level ring, just going from controller to IO to ETAP, right? But what kind of came in the mix in the last year or so is the switch level ring. So, um, so the, the, the picture on the, on the uh, I'm sorry, the far right first one, but the far left here, the switch level ring is now I can actually tie my 5700s together into this DLR ring and use the DLR protocol to be the, um, to, 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 to manage that ring. And then um, here in the last couple months, what's called phase two of the DLR um, is the ability to actually mix. So I can have mixed uh, devices and switches inside of that ring. So this kind of shows the, um, they, so Rockwell had, has this like phase one, two, and there's a phase three, which should be out uh, in next year, um, which will give you the ability to add a redundant gateway into your ring. So up to this point, um, everything is kind of a, a, a single gateway within the ring. And I think they've tried to do some testing on the redundant gateway. And, and so they're, they're working through some, some stuff there. The other part, like, just like uh, Luis said in the very beginning with the CPWE thing, um, there is a design guide spe specific to device level rings. And uh, that's the link to it right there. We also had the link on our, um, on our page, for, uh, you know, for our user group page for this, for this session. Um, so just like uh, Luis was saying, these are characterized and tested things that Rockwell has done in their factory. So they, they put together these systems and they built it this you know, particular way and, and they documented that and they tested it. And then they kind of, you know, they put it into this design implementation guide or dig as they call it. And um, basically saying that if you build it in the way that we kind of tell you in the way how we've tested it, characterized it, then you will get these results, right? We have tested these, you know, these conditions and, and these are the results you should see when you build it this way. So we'll, yeah, we'll Wayne, definitely show you what, mm -hmm, yep. Yeah, I was just gonna mention for the, um, the folks that are online, I went ahead and put the link to our website that has all of the documentation. So they, and they're able to see it go download. You'll see two different, so for uh, also the people there, there's gonna be white papers and then there's gonna be design guides. The white papers are usually only about five to about 15, 20 pages max because it's just a really high level overview with some architecture pictures and kind of a synopsis. And if you want to take a nap, you go to the design guides, which are about 90 to 100 pages long, and those go deep dive. Yep, good, thanks. And for those in the room, and we'll follow up usually with an email after, and we'll, we'll make all these links accessible to you guys. Um, because it's a lot of, and you'll be, when we go to the end and you'll see all the references that are available, it's, it's, there's a lot a lot of references to help you um, navigate through all this. Um, so uh, I think we, we kind of mentioned this a few slides back, but can, uh, can any managed switch be in the DLR? And the answer is no. Uh, it has to be a Stratix 5700 or a 5400 or um, the soon to be released 5800 uh, when, that, when that guy comes out but you cannot put a third party switch in there. You can't even put another Cisco switch in there. It has to be the uh, Stratix 5700 or 5400. Um, and then to just, to, to kind of help you and prevent, um, you know, boo-boos from happening, not all 5700 switches can 
support the DLR protocol. Only particular ones can do it. Um, typically, the, the 20 port and 18 port models can do it. And then a, and only two of the 10 port models can do it. Um, all the 5400s uh, can support DLR. There's only a few permutations of the 5400, so it's not as bad. There's like, what, 25 permutations of the 5700, so that one gets a little confusing. So there's a nice chart. Um, the 5700, the product profile has a nice chart, which gives you all the little, you know, what can it do, what it can't do. So always reference that chart um, if you're looking specifically for DLR protocol. And I would imagine, like most of the Stratic switches, you know, once you buy it, you can't flash it up to DLR if you wanted that capability. So just always be careful with that up front. Um, Armor Stratix 2, which is something we don't really see in our neck of the woods down here, but it can handle um, one ring as well. All right, so single DLR ring. So in these examples here, we're looking at, uh, this could be a 5700 switch. It could also be a 5400 switch. Um, but here's some examples of the, uh, of the um, kind of a mixed device switch level ring right here on the, on the, on the left and then a, a switch ring on the, on the right. Um, so the key here, and this is probably, you know, would probably seem like common sense, but uh, just one of those things to, to know is that once you set a ring speed, all the devices in that ring have to be the same speed, right? So if you're, again, so the, the 5400, like we said, is an is a all gig switch. So, you know, you would have to be at all gig speed if you were, you know, in a ring there. Um, or if you're going to be 100 megabyte, uh, 100 megabits devices, and you got to make sure everything in the ring is is at 100 megabit speed. Um, typically, you set everything to auto negotiate, and it kind of would figure it out. But but you need to um, just be careful with that. You can't have mixed speeds inside of one ring. Um, one advantage of the ring, and you know, with any Ethernet networking, is you can mix your, you know, mix your media. So there's no issues here. So if you need to go fiber for a for a long distance, you can go to fiber, go back to copper. Um, so you can mix the mix the media throughout the ring with no issues. Now, here's something that you know, quite honestly, is probably not very well known, is that the Stratex 5400 switch can support three separate. DLR rings out of that one switch. So in this little example uh, diagram, um, I can um, I can have um, you know three rings, and each one could be a whole separate VLAN. Um, I should note that too. I don't know if it was on a slide. I might have missed it, but um, everything on the ring has to be the same VLAN as well. And that's kind of a probably another kind of a common sense thing, but just to make sure you know, so you can't have um, you know a VLAN 300 item sitting over there in the VLAN 100 ring um, over here. So each one of these rings is completely independent and separate from each other. So if anything happens in ring, you know, the VLAN 100 ring, it has no impact or bearing on anything that happens in the other two rings. So, and you can also mix your speeds on, meaning uh, mix your speeds in that, you know, LAN 1, VLAN 100 ring could be 100 megabit. VLAN 200 could be all gigabit. So you can actually uh, have one one switch can can kind of can do a lot here for you. Mm -hmm. so yes. Yeah, good point. Dean uh, wanted to make sure we, we stress that and it was on the slide back there. We probably didn't say it out loud, uh, but the 5700 can only support one ring. So that's a good point. 5400 can can support up to three. All right, so just like before, and I just, I just mentioned it, so, um, you know, um, each ring has to be, you know, the same speed throughout each one of the rings. So what would happen if you were to mix this? Like, if you mix a speed, is it just not going to work at all, or it's just going to default to the slowest speed? I don't know, Alicia, uh, I don't know if you heard that question, but what happened if somebody stuck a, like a gig, you know, a, a, a gig a device and it was 100 megabits. Um, I guess if it was on auto negotiate, it would sort it out. But if it wasn't, consider it as the, the weakest link. So if you have everything at a gig and you put something in line that's 100 meg, you now degraded the entire system to 100 meg. If okay, it's so the other way around and it's all 100 meg and you put something at a gig, that gig connection is now communicating at a 100. 
That's basically what yeah. it works. You won't lose any of that communication. Yeah, just gonna bring it. Yeah. If you're expecting a gig out of it, you're not gonna get it basically. Yeah, okay. Um, yep, so again, um, kind of saying the same thing. You can, um, everything has to be um, the same throughout. And you're allowed mixed medias, same thing here, right? So the, the, the DLR architecture doesn't change just because it went to a 5400 switch. You can do mixed media as well. Now, DHCP, so, um, so here again, the, the, if you're using the Stratix 5700 or the 5400 as your ring supervisor, it can act as a DHCP server for the devices in your ring. Um, so the way how that kind of works, and we're gonna show some setup on that here a little bit later, um, but you can basically, um, each device kind of has a, 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 like a, position in the ring, like an index number as they refer to it. So the supervisor is gonna be index one or position one, and then it'll kind of go out on along the ring and say, okay, next device, you're two, then three, then four, then five, then six. So assuming your ring is static and you're not moving things or adding things to your ring, you know, the advantage of a DHCP uh, persistence in the ring is that if you had to change out one of these devices, like this point IO or the flex, PowerFlex drive, you don't necessarily have to worry about putting back an IP address in that guy. You just put it, you just replace it, put it in. If it's in DHCP mode, which it should be by default, it's going to get its IP address assigned to it from the switch. Okay. Um, so that's, that's, that's a nice benefit for maintenance and for, you know, reduced downtime type of stuff. But you got to be very careful there too, because, um, Again, your industrial control system is expecting things to be at the right IP address. So you got to you know, make sure your DHCP is, is set up right in your, in your um, so we don't have uh, IP conflicts. Yep. Yeah, so uh, another feature, um, especially for the, uh, for the drives, is uh, automatic device recovery, recovery or AD. Uh, C, is it ADR, ADC? There's an acronym for it, but it, it, automatic device recovery basically. So meaning that the controller, such as the, the control logic controller that's in this ring, you know, if you were to switch a, device, a drive out middle of the night, you know, you put it in, the switch will assign its IP address to it. And then the controller will actually send all of the drive parameters back to the drive automatically. Um, so your technician, at two o'clock in the morning, really didn't have to do anything other than physically take out the drive, put a new one in, energize it, and then all the magic happened with the switch, assign IP address, and the controller putting the parameters back into that drive. Um, I put this slide here because it gave some references to a couple of knowledge base articles and some other um, links again. So back to the, to the, uh, the point of DLR, but there's a knowledge base article about DHCP persistence um, for both uh, uh, DLR as well as the Stratix. So the, so the point here too is that the Stratix switch can also be a DHCP server for things that are not in the ring. So it can be the, uh, uh, so there's DLR DHCP and then there's just DHCP persistence. So again, in this situation, this little diagram here, you got a ring going, but then you have a, a PowerFlex drive just kind of tied off to the switch outside of the ring. So you can do that same DHCP persistence and automatic device configuration. I think that's actually what it is, ADC, automation, autom automatic device configuration, regardless if it's in the ring or not. Okay, so network capacity. Um, so, you know, this is a very important part, and this is something that was tested, again, part of that characterization that, the, that Rockwell did, you know, test it. Um, so again, you, as you would imagine, as you get too many devices in that ring, then things are gonna start to, you know, get bottlenecks and, and some network issues. So there are some limits to what we can and can't do in the ring. Um, the, the main limit that we've always preached and talked about is that for a device level ring is you, less than 50 ring nodes inside of a ring. Um, and that wasn't necessarily a, if you went to 51, you're going to shut down, but that's really more of the, um, you know, once you kind of get beyond 50, 
for the time for that beacon to get all the way around the ring and back, you're going to start to see some, some, uh, you know, some latency there. And we talked earlier that, you know, DLRs are usually the best and the fastest convergence time to recover from a fault. So as you add more devices out there, that late, you know, you're going to in, in, introduce additional latency in there and, and can impact that convergence time. So 50 has always been the, the number. Now that we've added the switch level um, ring to it, you can add a whole bunch of things to these switches, right? So we can have, you know, a, a ring of switches and have a whole bunch of devices tied to each one of these switches. So there is a limit to a single VLAN again, and one subnet, basically 253 in devices kind of tied off to all these switches in, in, in the ring. So 50 things in the ring and, yep. Yeah, so Dean was just uh, getting technical with the actual time. So three milliseconds would be your convergence time. Less yeah. than three milliseconds if you're less than 50 nodes. Yep. And one quick thing to add is just for anybody wondering a node, the easiest way to think about it is an IP address. So as we start looking at it, 50 seems very high. But when you start connecting to ETAP devices uh, and you're doing like fiber versions, each one of those would also have an IP address associated to it. So just make sure that you're looking at it. And to Wayne's point, we don't have a hard limit at 50. That is a recommendation. But once you start going past the 50, you have a chance of that three milliseconds convergence time to start increasing. And once it gets to a certain point, you're no longer able to catch up when you're doing that communication and your bandwidth. So there are some knowledge-based articles that talk about being able to test against your system. All right, thanks Luis. Okay, so here is actually what was tested when it came to the switch level um, architecture, switch level ring architecture. So there, so the, the recommendations from, the, from Rockwell's engineering group is up to 24 switches in that ring, all right? So we just said 50 devices, 50 nodes in the ring, but if you're doing switches, they're saying don't go past 24. Uh, and again, mixed 5,400 and 5,700 switches in the ring. Um, once again, either 100 megabit or one gigabit, but not mixed in a single VLAN. So this kind of gives you the, the idea of the possibility of what you can now do with the device level ring, right? So this is also what we're getting at with all these devices tied to the switches, um, the amount of stuff you can now bring in into this ring. You can, of course, do multiple rings and kind of bring them back. So, you, you know, talk about the gateway, you know, kind of the gateway device. So kind of bring that back up into your distribution level switches. So we have a few different rings going on now. We have four rings. Um, again, we have two rings, two independent rings, and each one is VLAN 10. That's perfectly fine. Um, we've got a VLAN 20 ring and a VLAN 30 ring. So that's perfectly fine. So once again, any, you can't put a VLAN 30 device over here into this VLAN 10 ring. Right, so once again, you can't mix your VLANs. We also show off to the side just a, just a good old uh, star topology on VLAN 10, right? So that's perfectly fine too. So the, you know, anything out there on the, um, you know, out, other part of the plant and star topology can communicate to the devices inside of the VLAN 10 rings shown there as well. Now, kind of getting back to um, the, some of the uh, resiliency protocols. So this was something that was tested by Rockwell. So we kind of go back, we show the, uh, you know, we show a lot of the uplink stuff, the gateway stuff going back up to these distribution switches. Um, and so they tested that and they said, okay, what are the best ways, what are the best protocols available to you to, to make those connections up to the next layer? Um, so their recommendations is mainly with the green boxes, anything with a checkbox that they validated, um, anything with a green box with a check, it's something they actually validate it and they would recommend. So they recommend flex links for the most part um, as your resiliency protocol to communicate back up. And you can go to a, a, a Stratex 5410, which is the Stratex version of a distribution switch, or you, they also tested it with the Catalyst, Cisco Catalyst 3850 and the 4500X. Now, device uh, integrated architecture builder and if we have some time at the end, I'll, I'll fire it up. 
it's a great tool if you're not familiar with it. It allows you to, uh, to build systems and, and uh, kind of validate systems ahead of time in a, in a free software package. You can download it off of Oracle's website. Um, there's a lot of networking stuff available to you inside of Integrated Architecture Builder, and you have the ability to build DLR rings inside of IAB as well. So once you kind of create your, your uh, area, you can go down to network and you can say add a device level ring, and you can, it'll pop, you know, create a ring and you can start populating devices on the ring. The reason why this is, is beneficial for you to do is because it will give you, um, it'll kind of give you some of the network capacity statistics based on what you're, what you're building here, right? So as you build it a ring, you can kind of go in and you can get some, some statistics on what it expects to see there based on what it is, right? It's a controller, it's a IO drop, it's a drive. This is the type of traffic that we'd expect to see there. So you can kind of map all this out ahead of time and validate your system, your design before you actually try to deploy it for real. If you see green, that's always a good sign, right? Yellow or red would be a, uh, would be you're pushing it or, or you went too far. Okay, so um, this part's kind of nice because we get some always get questions and, and things and thought it'd be kind of nice to show some of the things that you cannot do, right? So one of the things you cannot do is, now barring that this is not a 5400 and we have two identical rings here, but you know, they're trying to show this as a DLR ring one, instant, instance one, instant two, basically trying to make a figure eight out of your ring, right? You cannot do that, all right? One ring, you can't tie a second ring in there or try to bring in that through the switch. Um, you cannot use this, you cannot use one of those resiliency protocols at the same time as the DLR protocol on a port, meaning that if I'm trying to make these two switches here, talk up to the distribution switch and I'm making this, um, STP or flex links or ether channel, in addition to having it a DMI DLR port, you can't do that. You have to have two separate DLR ports identified and you can have two separate flex links or ether channel ports identified going up to the, uh, to the distribution level. This one is a very common question that we get. And it's like, there's always confusion about the EN2T, you know, control logics EN2TR module. There's two ports on it. Well, can I just take one port and tie it to one switch and take one port and tie it to the second switch? And the answer to that is no, you cannot do that. Um, unless, again, you're, you're using the DLR protocol, specifically using DLR protocol to make that ring. Um, that is, um, the EN2TR is a single IP address. It's just a built-in switch, basically, two ports built-in switch. So you cannot, it's not a redundancy in that it can handle two links from two separate switches, like it's kind of shown in this, on this diagram. Um, another one is ETAPs. So ETAPs cannot be, uh, don't, would not be used for any kind of gateway uplinking, all right? So the ETAP has two kind of ring ports in the bottom and it has a device level port in the front. So that device port is really intended to, to communicate to some kind of device in the field, like a, like a drive or something that doesn't have a DLR port built into it. You need to put it on the ring. So you would not do your, your gateway uplinking through an ETAP. So here's another one too, right? Say um, I've got a, uh, I've got kind of got two segments here and say, hey, well, why not can I just, um, you know, close the, you know, close the link there and, uh, and make my own little ring out of that. Well, again, you just introduced a, uh, you know, you just introduced some bad stuff to your network unless you are using the DLR protocol specifically. So you just can't just tie those ports together and expect it to, uh, to work. Kind of same thing here. So in this case, we didn't really have two uh, separate segments, but we said, okay, we've got another switch out there. Can we just tie it back to that switch? And that's kind of the same thing as the uh, control logic example. You know, just because it has two ports, doesn't mean I can just go to a second switch. All right. So here's some tools that um, you may or may not be aware of. Um, we'll kind of go through these um, here just quickly. 
Um, so mainly the order of the order configuration would be, you, you know, you're going to set up your supervisor, set up any kind of gateway, set up your ring ports and speed, and then set up your participants. Now there are two kind of a couple ways to do this that uh, again, you may or may not be aware of the Stratix products have this uh, thing called device manager. So you can use your, um, your, your browser like Chrome, whatever your browser choice is. You log into the switch. So switch will have an IP address for it. You, you log into your device manager and you can choose if it's a, if it's, if it's a DLR enabled 5700 switch, for example, under configuration or configure, there'll be a DLR um, setting for you. And then from here, you can set up um, basically what's its mode. Is it a supervisor or um, is it just a, a node, a beacon node, as it would be called there. Um, you can identify, tell it what two ports are DLR ports. So you can actually call it out by name that this port and this port are my DLR ports. And if you are a supervisor, you know, you, you could, um, you could kind of, you know, mess with the settings. Typically it's suggested to not mess with those settings unless there's some reason to do so. But the only thing you might mess with here is the precedence. Um, and the precedence is back to where we had the, uh, the supervisor and, and the uh, backup supervisor. So the, the precedence is how the system would kind of determine who should be supervisor. If you had two or three switches all identified as supervisors, they would have a precedence to them. So whoever has the highest precedence, he is the supervisor. And then the next one, you know, down would become the next guy to take supervisor if, if the highest precedence one wasn't available. If you want to do the DHCP in your ring, then that's actually configured just on the very next tab over, right? So um, configure DHCP. And then essentially, there's uh, not much to do here. You enable it. Uh, it's typically rec recommended to keep the DHCP snooping enabled as well. And then you tell it what's its role. So you have a primary and backup DHCP server. So am I the primary or backup for the DHCP? And then the table. So here's where it'll kind of, the table will say, okay, index two, that's no, basically no two in the ring. IP address is this. Um, and uh, what pool is it coming from? So that's basically the DHCP pool that you can create. Now, everything we just did there, can actually be done in, right inside of Studio 5000. So if you had the add-on profile for the Stratix switches included in your um, Studio 5000, you have all the ability to do everything, uh, all the configuration of the switch right inside of Studio 5000. And again, that gets back to this whole ITOT convergence messaging that's been out for quite some time. You know, the, the value of the Stratix product is that it is a Cisco product, so your IT guys can use their Cisco tools and configure it. But you as an OT guy, you can use your stuff that you're familiar with to configure it as well. So Studio 5000 is that tool. Um, now in this example, they're showing a screenshot of a 5400 because we have the rings one, two, and three. So enables, you know, you just simply enable, you know, ring one, two, three. Um, you select the two ports, right? Where are DLR ports? Um, it gives you some uh, DLR status information right there off to the, off to the right. You can also, uh, you know, are you supervisor mode, just like we showed a minute ago, any advanced network configuration. So again, that's where you would set your precedence. And then you can also do the DHCP management right inside of the Studio 5000 as well. What is its role? Uh, what are the number of uh, ring members? And then the index, DHCP index. All right, so along the same lines, there's some tools out there that you may not be familiar with if you're trying to manage or monitor or troubleshoot your ring. So going back into the device manager, the switch itself. So now if you went one tab over, we were in the configure tab at the top, now we'll go to the monitor tab. So there's monitor and DLR. And we get all of our um, DLR overview uh, information, right? So we get things like um, if I'm in a, what topology am I? Am I in a normal state? Uh, who are my ports? What two ports are my ring ports? Um, am I, a, a, am I a, the supervisor? And am I also a DHCP server, right? So if the DHCP is enabled, it will show you that right inside of there. 
Um, but here's the really nice thing that might be a bit of a secret is you go to the faults tab. So now I can look at um, how many faults have I uh, since power up and where are the ring fault locations? So I see that I have a last active node on port one. So again, the beacon's going on, on port one of the ring port. It goes out to IP address uh, dot 56. Port two beacon went out and went to dot 14. So from there, you can kind of isolate, well, where's my issue? Somewhere between those two devices is where I can track my problem down to. Um, and then on the members, I can actually look at all the members that are in the ring, right? So this doesn't have to necessarily be a DHCP thing. This is just all the members that are in the ring, what's their node position, and what's their MAC address, as well as IP address. Then I can do some statistics, right? So I can see um, the topology again, um, who's the, uh, the active ring supervisor, if it's enabled. Uh, and if we do want to do, um, oh, this was for DHCP, I believe, or just, no, maybe not. This looks like the same stuff. So again, you could do DHCP management from inside of there as well, or, or monitoring. Um, now, the faceplates. So we can get back to the faceplates, DLR faceplates. So if you are using logics and you're using Factor Talk View, uh, HMI, be it a panel view or uh, SC for your computer, you can load in an uh, add-on instruction into your controller, a faceplate into your HMI, and you can get this, this information visually or graphically uh, for your operators. And it gives uh, basically, a, it shows you all the nodes in the ring, the little uh, crowns or who's the supervisor, and then who might be the backup supervisors. It'll give you um, details on the topology status, participants, um, and then you can actually scroll through and look at all the participants in the ring, you know, one by one and kind of see what's happening and what's going on with those, with those uh, nodes. And any faults will be identified under the, the red bell as well. And one huge benefit to talk about for the DLR tool is all the little pretty pictures that you saw on that screen are automatically populated from the work that you did of setting up the supervisor and the backup uh, active supervisor. So every single one of those devices are found via Studio 5000 and the HMI without you having to actually create all of those. Yep, good point. Um, yep, and so you say, okay, that's great, but I don't use Factor Talk View SE or I don't have a panel view. Um, well, um, there is a DLR tool that actually is a download part of the Studio 5000 um, tools, I guess it's called. There's a, there's a bunch of tools that come that you can download and, and install as part of Studio 5000. And there's a DLR tool there as well. So that will basically be the same thing as that faceplate, but without you having to have the Factory Talk View SC running at the same time. So you can basically fire up a tool you kind of use almost like uh, links, you kind of point to the device in the ring and then it'll kind of create the ring, uh, the ring graphic and it'll give you um, all the same information you kind of get out of that faceplate um, through that tool. All right, so we pretty much come to the end and, um, and like we've been saying all along, there's a ton of resources out there. So every one of these things are hyperlinks. So when we get the, the slides out, they'll be posted you can click on all these guys and it'll bring you to it. So um, Luis introduced the CPWE stuff way back in the beginning. So, so here's all those um, documents, uh, white papers, design guides are, are kind of linked on this slide. Um, and this is a lot of stuff. So again, there are, there are lots and lots of resources available to you all around networking. Um, anything from um, wireless, to uh, you know, secure, you know, going across industrial uh, DMZs, um, network address translation, um, resiliency. So we talked about resiliency protocols quite a bit. Firewalls, um, device level rings. So this is the guy right here, um, you know, that, that 
refers to everything we've been talking about today is, is how to kind of design and deploy a device level ring in this architecture. Um, so on and so forth. So like uh, I think Luis mentioned way back, uh, there is both a design guide and a white paper. So there's two references, kind of a, an easier, easier thing to digest and a, and a much more technical thing to digest with the design guide. And the uh, last but not least is the integrator architecture builder. And also something that's uh, a hidden secret a lot of times is there are a um, configuration drawings available to you at, on Rockwell's website. So they have a lot of typical system configuration drawings. They kind of show you how the architecture will look and they give you a lot of little notes and ex explode, you know, exploded um, bubbles out that kind of explain a lot of things like do this, do this, do this, or use this, use this, use that. And, um, those are really nice things to know about. Um, so there's a link to them. Um, that red at the top is a link to that as well. And with that, uh, we're a couple minutes before the top of the hour, so uh, we'll inter welcome uh, anyone's questions at this time. Um, I'll show you, I have the IAB up already, but basically just to show you that we can you know, create very similar ring architectures. And um, if you were to come here, I can make my mouse do this. If I enable the, uh, the cable information, I can now get the kind of those green dots we we're showing earlier. And I can look at, you know, if I put my, oops, put my mouse on it. Come on, stay there. I can look at what's the expected, you know, utilization and traffic on that particular segment, right? So that uplink port is, is um, it's on VLAN 30 and it's only at 0.1% utilization um, traffic. So, uh, so yeah, so it gives you some good, some good statistics. Yep. No, not inside the ring, not inside the ring. Okay, but outside, the ring. outside the ring, absolutely. Yes. Yep. So right. So you just that for for it to be able to, to to speak the DLR protocol, it has to be one of those devices, the 5700 switch or the 5400 switch, and it can handle the beacon. It has to be able to you know handle the, the protocol, the beacon protocol coming around. So just throw something else in that mix inside inside of that ring, it's not going to know how to handle that. So ETAP is a very common way that we've always done that. So if you had some kind of oddball thing that you know, third party or, or didn't, didn't have a DLR port built into it, then you could put an ETAP in that ring and put it into the ETAP and that would, enter, that would allow that thing to get onto the ring. Um, but now with the switches, you, know, you can bring off. So now the topology underneath that 5700 can be a whole mix of things, right? The only limit there is you you have to stay within that one subnet. You got to stay within 253 total devices for that entire ring. All right, Luis, I wasn't getting the monitor. Is there any questions online? Um, no, currently it looks like everybody's shy online. I've been trying to get them to open up, but they don't want to. <laughs> That's okay. Um, all right, um, so anyway, it's, uh, I want to thank Luis uh, for, for joining and helping with this presentation as well. And uh, um, again, device level ring seemed kind of simple, but uh, there's a lot, of, a lot of stuff there, a lot of capability that may not have been known or, you know, kind of, um, you know, just didn't, wasn't quite aware of. So, so you can do a lot of stuff, much larger systems now with your ring. Um, and we'll probably give you an update next year too, once phase two comes out with, with the redundant gateway capability as well. So I think we'll close it out. Luis, you got any final comments uh, before we close no, it out? Great job. Thanks for having me on. All right. Well, appreciate everybody's time today, and we'll we'll shut it down. Take care, everyone. <laughs>